largest steam traction engine gathering, a gamble on steam. I think steam is a bit like women, you know, a bit unpredictable. You have to humour it. You can't make it do what you want it to do, like a diesel engine. You have to go along with it and meet it halfway. It's like a good oil painting or, uh, let's say, a good wine. It does something for you. Maybe the smell of steam, the roar of the engines. It, uh, I don't know, it's like a really good injection, isn't it? It's certainly addictive always demanding more to satisfy the cravings of those infected by its power. I find it uh, pretty incredible to think that this, um, the rally and the basis of the rally started oh, eight years ago when I bought the um, roller. It's uh, very odd that uh, conversation, a chance conversation with Ted Ainsworth in the car park of the uh, pub outside Christ Rally. Uh, should have led first to my buying the, the roller in Chesterfield for three and a half thousand pounds I paid for it uh, and then fetching it home and the, beginning to feel my way with it and uh, steam being what it is, drawing the family in with me and they all getting involved and the need for more engines and purchasing the flowers and the whole thing has built up dramatically in a way such that by now we have three engines on this rally fields and we're surrounded by all our friends and all our friends' families um, it really is incredible. I, I just hope that uh, this is the start of a, of a long and successful family rally. Tony Marchington's ambition was cradled in the gentle Derbyshire hills, where little appears to have changed since the days of steam. Tony is an industrial chemist, but his family, like generations of Marchingtons before them, farm in Bucksworth. And it was with the family he worked out his plans for a gathering of steam traction engines, the largest in the northwest a summer frolic for enthusiasts, a gamble on steam. His gamble was a risk. He had no experience of organizing a major event, only the deep commitment to steam, which started when he was just five. I can remember standing on a showman's engine, and I must have been very impressed and slightly frightened, because I remember it not as a particularly pleasurable thing, but more the sort of thing that, that sticks in your mind for whatever reason. And then I think I said to myself, well, I, you know, one of these days I'm going to try and own one of those things. But one was not enough. First a steamroller, then the enthusiast's dream, a rare matched pair of 1918 Fowler plying engines, fame and fortune. Yet still not satisfied, he's prepared to gamble one of these treasured possessions to share his love of steam with others. If the Lime Park rally fails, one of them will have to be sold to pay off the overheads. Well, I, I thought I'd go on the, on the roller with uh, John. But the gamble yeah. is put to the background we'll, we'll two days before the rally, as the Marchingtons concentrate on the nine-mile journey to Lime Park. Tony's zeal for steam has fired the family. His father, Frank, even organises life on the farm to accommodate time for the engines. Joe Chalice worked on steam ploughs 60 years ago. His knowledge is a priceless bond between the past and present. Last season, we, I think, perceived, although it had been happening for a long time, we perceived a change in local rallies. First of all, there weren't as many. Um, three of the big rallies in the Midlands this year are no longer happening because of, they've run into financial problems, uh, largely through bad weather. And uh, we're always wanting to go to rallies and we want to road our engines to rallies. We don't want to put them on low loaders because we don't enjoy that as much. And we realised that um, we weren't going to have a rally season if we weren't careful. And so we, uh, we thought about it as a family and uh, we talked to a few of the other local steam fraternity and we said, blow it, we'll organise our own. Sometimes we go on 400 mile treks and the most difficult mile is the first half mile and the last half mile and that's down into the village because of the construction work going on in the village. There's been a diversion put in. People who are doing the construction have put across a, a temporary Bailey Bridge, which uh, we're told has a three-ton limit. 
the ploughers fully laden will be close on 25 tonnes each and the steamroller will be about 15 tonnes. So we'll be nigh on 10 times in excess of the official weight limit. They're taking bets whether we'll actually go across or go through. <laughs> Just another risk in a life where steam will always be a challenge. The prospect of borrowing £30,000 to buy the ploughing engines was daunting, even for him. Yet his compulsion knew no limits. I remember for the first year that I was paying back the loan, I had a pretty good salary coming in from ICI, and uh, I paid a, a rent, and put in the various other bills, and I had uh, £10 a week to live on. And in fact, uh, it was such that at one stage I couldn't even afford the rent on the room I was living in, so I got somebody else to fill the room, and I went with a sleeping bag and a camp bed and lived under the table in the front room for 12 months. Steam engines were made at a time and by a generation which, in my view, were vastly superior to the current generation. And then there's just the physical attraction of it, the, the, the heat and the warmth and the comfort and the smell uh, and the power of the steam engine. It's, it's a beautiful piece of machinery which is you know, very closely matched to what people wanted them to do. For me, when, when I travel, it's a challenge. You've got a great big lump of iron, and half of it is so old and so crystallised, it sometimes makes you wonder how it's all sticking together. Three quarters of my time is spent looking all over the front, uh, at, at the motion work to see that it's all there. I glan I'm glancing down the side of the engine, checking round it, checking the oilers, and uh, it's the, I think it's the challenge of making it move. Once we get out into the A6, there's no, no stopping, really, and we present them with just a wall of machinery because the kit is 90 foot long in total. So um, you get two basic reactions. There are those who are wildly enthusiastic, such that they almost sometimes become a nuisance. And then you get the other guy who's uh, late for the office, who's had a row with a wife, and who's behind and trying to get past. But they seem to, they seem to move along behind. You, you, I mean, let's face it, you, you can't do very much when you've got 25 tonnes of steam in front of you, and except grin and bear it. the eve of the first annual steam rally at Lime Park. Tony's enthusiasm is put to the test. Will the promised support materialize? The steam fraternity is loyal, but their machines can be unpredictable. With so much at stake, it's going to be a tense day. Get a good run. You ride down the far side, behind, right behind the beer tent, straight down the side. Uh, you want to be right up to the top of the hill, you'll yeah. see the end of You've got your fairground on the left, the engine's on the right. Yeah. Take the left hand fork of the two all the way down and find the first available site on the left hand fork. K7, you want to go, I put you all together, your uh, exhibition of the engine together, and, and I've marked two. you out by your stall number. Right down behind the beer tent. Is that all right? Back against that uh, mound. So what you want to do is come onto the grass, uh, go around by where we've got the ox roast, yeah. and you'll see there's a big triple area marked out between two pegs, and you want to reverse into there. Okay. Uh, are you going to be driving the drum? Will be tomorrow and Sunday. Yes. Well, you may actually have to... Um, we may actually decide to bring you forward out of the line of trade stands so that you can yeah. actually do that as a separate exhibit. Where, where's your water bowser, Tony? The water bowser currently is being emptied by um, Frank and Norris. Then oh, Jimmy okay. Stevenson wants to go at it. Is he? Yeah. Are you desperate? Not desperate, no. No, well, we can get it over to you within half an hour. If we're third in line, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 
You can fill your back tank out of it quite easily. Great stuff. <laughs> Jolly good. Are you all right then? That was uh, that was the crew of the Iron Maiden, I think. They're just they're just going down to fetch her over. Oh, very good, because I've been promised to stay up. Have you? I have. How do you angle that then? Oh well, <laughs> that's going to be telling. <laughs> Quite yeah. an innovation, a rally here. Yeah, I nice, think, nice know, side, isn't it? We should enjoy it. Yes, there'll be some nice pictures going for those that bring cameras. Now, are you, have you fetched your cameras? Oh, yes. And you're doing some pictures for World's Fair as well? Isn't it? Well, I'm doing some pictures. I don't know whether they want yeah. them or whether they'll send somebody else, but I'll certainly take some yeah. shots for yeah. this weekend, anyway. Yeah. Um, it's got great possibilities, isn't it, really? It's, it's, a, great, it's a great site, isn't it? Tremendous. Lovely site. Yeah. It's a bit of a breezy today, but... Um, if it just, uh, if the wind, wind's no fiercer than this, and uh, we just mm. keep getting a few uh, clouds and a little bit of sunshine, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Oh, marvellous. Uh, yeah. Tremendous. Tremendous. So, well, uh, when are you bringing the engine uh, in? John, that'll be no problem. John with the um, uh, bashing box. Yeah. I thought we'd have him working just further on up. That's right. We can pinch some of his straw tonight. Yes, we and can. And I'll fetch some straw down tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah, all right. You know, to replace it. What, and I thought what we'd do is put John slightly off centre so that we could still see him. I think we've got most of the stuff on now. Um, there's some stuff arriving tomorrow morning between about 8 and 12. But right. um, yeah, it's mostly together now. Good. Okay, no. Right, no, Beb, go. Beb's coming back for tonight for a pint. So if you want to stroll down about uh, 9 o'clock, we'll all have a, if, if you know, I'll have a get-together and just a, a look round and a way out. Okay, fine. See you later on. See you later, okay. Peter. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? See this in the cold? Yeah. I'll just show you that. In the cold, then. Yeah. What about putting the castle in there? Oh, all right. Oh, all right. Right. You're all right there, are you? Tony, I've, uh, I've got a half-size steam lorry there, where do you, and uh, number's 102. Um, where do you want me to drop it? Uh, it's a trailer. Now then, now then. Have we got a start? Uh, we haven't got any signs worked out for steam mixers. Oh, play it by ear. Play it by ear, really. OK. Play it by ear. Now, Fred's going up like, near the coal. Yeah. Uh, that's a, no, that's handy. I wouldn't mind being near the coal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Frederick's companion? <laughs> <laughs> no, the one. He said, have you run out of petrol? Because we were stopped. And on the way here, it's what? 30 odd miles from Bolton. We've caused no less than four motor car crashes. And, one, one, yeah. we're not, we're not and nothing to do with us. We were scientifically stopped when these disasters happened. It's been a very, very busy day. I was here at six o'clock this morning, and the cars started arriving about eight. And I don't know what time it is now. It feels like, oh, I don't know, a long, long time after midnight, but it, it must be about 10 o'clock, I think. Uh, everybody's on, uh, which I'm surprised about, because I was getting a bit worried about six o'clock, uh, that we just frankly didn't have space. Uh, we've had a lot of interest from locally from the villagers, and they've been wanting to come up, and they've been fetching cars and families. So there have been cars in places where we should have engines and exhibits. Exhibits are still arriving. There are still some to come tomorrow. I'm just hoping we can get them on. Uh, but the, the atmosphere, I think largely because of that, and largely because people sense that it's a first time do, and we're, uh, and we're struggling, uh, is, uh, is pretty good. Everybody's with us, I think. It's always said of the steam fraternity that it's, it's very, very broad. And 
That's certainly true in my experience. I know a priest. Um, there are wagon drivers. There are people like myself who are doctors and uh, other professional people who uh, who do it. There's no one characteristic that we could say, oh, that, that qualifies him as a steamer. He's likely to be as, uh, as diverse as, the, uh, as some of the engines are to, to drive. Uh, I mean, last night, when we packed in, we, we realised we were going to be tight on space. And this morning, between about 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, they just kept coming and coming and coming. And I just got uh, cries from the people at the back of the site that we just couldn't take any more. And we just kept sending them and sending them and sending them. And it got very bad at one stage. <coughs> uh, uh, but finally, they found a way through, and they all seemed to be in there, and they all seemed to be happy. Come in. Tony, come in. Frank here, over. Tony here, over. Tony, we're down at the main gate, and uh, all the blokes are spitting feathers. Uh, can you, could you get somebody in the beer tent to uh, bring about uh, five pints and a couple of lagers or something down? Uh, Mum is arranging lunch for us, but uh, there's one or two spitting feathers here. Over. Yeah, OK. Um, I'll pop down there in two ticks and get uh, some beer organised on trays. Over and out. There we are. Well, that's another problem. <laughs> and he doesn't know how true that is. Half a mile away, his pride and joy, Fortune, is bogged down in mud. But then problems are part and parcel of rallies. Everyone's had one. And there's always someone anxious to tell you about theirs. We had one problem with the engine some time ago. We were getting ready to go to a rally and the cylinder cracked. And we tried to get a spare cylinder for it. When we got on to Peugeot's, they wanted the serial and part number. <laughs> well, it doesn't have them again. But uh, we finished up, we had to make the whole cylinder ourselves. And we, we did it in a week. And, uh... But before the petrol combustion age, steam was a powerful pleasure. I was basically in certain roundabouts when I started. Uh, I had a little kiddies ride, and used to take that to rallies, and then I wanted something a bit bigger. And the fact that this was steam-driven from new, from original, when it was 1887, is the date of the steam engine, and it's, you know, typical piece of Victorian fairground, uh, fairground machine, with the, uh, you know, the horses, of course, and the card work, and the organ as well, with the brass trumpets that were made specially to out perform everything else on the fairground. They're supposed to be loud and blaring. So you know, so you can hear it for probably a couple hundred yards across the fairground. So they could compete with the others. And uh, it was a thing I always wanted, you know, and say it was luckily I've had the opportunity to get it. And granted it was in a very, very poor state when I bought it, you know, they did a lot of work. We've had to just about rebuild it. But the basics were there, you know, the, the bit in the middle was there and the, the patterns were there and by replacing the woodwork with the rotten woodwork, with new woodwork and the steelwork, using the old one as a pattern, we were able to get it as it is now. There's still a lot more to do, but we get in there slowly. What we wanted to do very much was to create the old Edwardian fair, uh, perhaps 80 years ago, here in Lyme Park. And I think that to put too much structure into that would have been a mistake. What we've done is we've put a little bit of, of the few of major exhibits around the patch and then we've let people come on and do what they want with it. And I think it's working. People are coming on and they're adjusting and finding their way. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's organized chaos at its very best. For Joe Chalice, time has slipped 60 years. 
He's back on the plough, where so much of his early life was spent on farms in Buckinghamshire. The familiar sounds and smells fuel childhood memories. I left school at 14 and I went straight onto these things. I went as a cook boy, you see, there were a gang of five, four men and a cook boy, to get the tea ready. And that cook boy, as he progressed, he was expected to do just the same as the others, which I did. And they found I could do it nearly as good as they could right from the start, because I saw I'd been brought up with it, and it went down very well. I'd, I'd met the girl that is now my wife. This is no good for a married man, because you're away for three and four weeks at a time, and never see home. And I thought, well, that would never work. So I thought, I'll pull out from this and get a job on a steamroller, which I did. So I pulled out from these in, what would it be, 1934? Because I got married in 1934. That was it. And I thought, well, that's the end of steam plowing. And as much as I regretted leaving it, I thought, well, I've had my share. I've, I've had a good run and I've really enjoyed it. It's a rough and tumble life, but that's it. I have really enjoyed it. threshing machine of the sort of machine they used to use for threshing the corn out of the straw in days when they used to cut the corn in the fields into and uh, tie it into sheaves, stack it until it was dry, put it into ricks, and then in the winter time when there was not much work on the farm, this is the time when this machine was used. From the age of steam, a unique exhibit. Well, it's the only example left of the Victorian tube shooter or rifle range. It uh, was developed about 1850 or 1860 when rifle shooting became a sport. Um, this example was actually built in 1903 and was used by an old showman for about 50 years. He lived in it and brought his family up in it. And uh, then he eventually retired and it was left behind derelict. And we collected it about 1960 and had to rebuild it and brought it to the stage it is now. And it's basically a, a rifle range on which you shoot down two tubes, one of which runs under the bed and the other one runs under the table. And they use live ammunition and the, the bullets go into a target stop at the end, so it's completely safe. And it's a type that's been in use for hundreds of years, but, which has practically disappeared. And this is the only one that's left in existence. Old Gaviola. It's been in our family for about 50 odd years. It wasn't new when we bought it. It was originally used in a set of juveniles. You know, uh, little roundabouts. I used to mind the juveniles and the organ was in the middle. This is the only thing I've got left out of it. So we bring it to rallies just for uh, sentimental reasons, that's all. Up until about three or four years ago, I'd built model locomotives of the type, little small ones. And um, I got a bit tired of seeking a tractor play on, and so I thought I'd build a road vehicle, and the council can provide me with 50 million miles of tractor play on. And so Lady Hamilton came into being. Uh, you probably noticed the connection between Lady Hamilton and my name. Uh, and it seems everybody that notices that, and it was a wife's idea, actually, that we should call her Lady Hamilton. The project t took about, I should think, in excess of 2,000 hours of work, spread over two years, that's sort of evenings and weekends, which, uh, as you can imagine, uh, led to some small amount of domestic <laughs> rift, but nothing too serious. The, the project as an exercise was rather 
rather overexposed me to engineering, I think, because uh, it went on for so long and I worked so hard at it. I think my uh, desire to create was more than fulfilled because it's almost two years since it was finished and I've not done right a lot since. And my wife calls a workshop a mausoleum uh, in memory to the what was like rather than what could be. We went down and met him in this, outside this warehouse and we peered in through the glass because we were a bit before him and there at the back of the shed was this little Avalon tractor uh, stripped right down with all the motion working bits on the The steam floor. man's equivalent yeah. of the angler's tail, and, uh, the one that got away. He finally arrived and I said to him, you know, how much money do you want? And he, oh, fantastic money he wanted, out to this world. So uh, I said, oh, no good at all, and we came away. And then it wasn't until we talked about coming to the rally that you, you made it clear that actually you'd gone about three months later and badgered him for about six months or something, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I went three months before you. Yeah. And I got it six months after you. Yeah. It took so long to get it off it. Yeah. yeah. I realised how poor condition it was. We decided then to just gut it completely. Shoot the box out. Put the boiler barrel back to here, three inches on the barrel, new tube plate, small box, complete the tender, box. rear axle, zero, zero, front zero. tyres, zero, zero, zero. chimney base, yeah. and all the bits that were missing we had to remake. But so how, how, when did you first turn out with this after, after your boss? It took me five years to actually run it. Oh, 1981, we fired it up for the first time. Oh, precious yeah. And then since then, we're still working on it. Oh. Um, she's a very famous traction engine because of the film, The Iron Maiden, and uh, it's just a great honour to be able to steer her. Uh, it's quite heavy because it's on grass and not on tarmac. Um, you know, you need, uh, you need to think quickly uh, and because you need to move your wheels a long time before you want the reaction. Uh, it's nice, it's lovely. <laughs> it gives us the chance to drive other engines which is something which we very rarely have. So it's good from that point of view. But also, it's, it's very good for us because it gives us the, uh, the incentive to get everything ready. All, there's a lot of work involved in getting these engines ready and bringing them here. And it is the, the excellent incentive to do that. Well, uh, I do anything, anything that I'm called to do. Uh, I brass clean, I drive, if they're short of a steersman, I do sheep roasts, I do engine men's lunches, I just do anything and I just like to be involved. I like the atmosphere these days, it's very pleasant. There's a lot of very cheerful people. This weekend is one of the happiest days of my life. After being away for so long, then come back to it, it's, it's really great. I have really enjoyed myself. Right, it's a bloody super place, you know. The thing is, the ground's a bit spongy. If it poured down, we'd all be up to axles. But I've never seen as many people at a traction engine rally on Saturday afternoon before in all my life. And I've been doing it for 18 bloody years, you know. Um, tomorrow, it'll be bedlam. You won't be able to move. You know? I, I expected at this time to feel really relaxed and happy about it, but I must say I'm feeling pretty shattered. <laughs> When we went into the rally, or well, in fact when I went into it, uh, I was £15,000 out of pocket, which is a lot of money. Uh, and uh, had it absolutely poured down uh, on the Saturday and Sunday, um, then uh, that money would have been down the drain. It would have meant uh, selling the flowers, I think. It's very nice to see it all gone off, all safely and nicely, and, and I've got my money back.